for Christ to come, O come, O come, Emmanuel, is at the center of our Advent season, a season marked by hopeful expectancy. Our Advent and Christmas celebrations draw our attention to Emmanuel, God with us, and how Jesus is with us in the past, in the present, and in the future. Christ has come to us as an infant born to share in our world, to meet us in our brokenness, Christ comes to us, to our, to our hearts, and meets us in our brokenness. And Christ will come to us in his return that signals the end of all brokenness. His coming was foretold by prophets. Isaiah says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This is our Advent preparation to straighten out the highways of our hearts to receive God. And so we wait with a heightened sense of anticipation for what God will do for us, for our families, for our church, and for our world. In Jeremiah we read, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. Each week, we, each week of Advent, we will light a candle. And of course, in the virtual context, we are doing that. Um, we'll do that at Bridalwood, and we're grateful this morning that Ben has videotaped that, and we showed it during our prelude. And then as we light a candle each week, we'll take this opportunity to read a candle litany together. And the candles represent the hope, the peace, the joy, and the love that we can only truly know in Jesus. And in this season, as the days are getting shorter, our candle lighting each week is an illustration of the growing light and progressive illumination. Let's read together responsibly our candle litany. The season of Advent begins and we celebrate the hope we find in the good news of the gospel. Through the birth, the birth of a tiny and healthy God's child, God comes, comes to save, save the world. world. While we watch and wait for Jesus, we join God's mission by bringing grace and mercy to those who need it most. We engage, we engage the poor, the poor and, and the poor in spirit, spirit letting, letting Christ's light, light shine, shine through, us. through us. We speak words of comfort and love to a world in need of hope and healing as we share our stories of God's transforming spirit. Together, Together, we are a sign, a sign of God's, of God's hope, hope for, for the, the world. world. Let us pray. God of, God of surprising grace, when we least expect it, you bring fresh flesh where we feel that all is lost. You bring redemption. 
Give us courage. Give us we share all you have done and all you are doing and all you will accomplish through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets Till a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory Till a cradle in the dirt
Straightening the highways of our hearts is no simple task. In fact, it's not something we can simply do on our own, but with Christ, who comes to us. We lean not on our own understanding, but we acknowledge our crooked ways and entrust our hearts to the one who makes our paths straight. Let's take this opportunity to bring our confession before God. Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us to remind us that you are our God and we are your people. Thank you for the gift of forgiveness and restoration. And ultimately, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who comes to us as a baby, as an infant, who comes to us in our brokenness and who will come again in glory. Forgive us, God, when we make ourselves so busy that we ignore your good gift to us. Forgive us, too, when we are distracted with our own pursuits that we don't see the needs of others. Forgive us when our sense of anticipation and expectation around this season is about what we will get. Forgive us for replacing our ultimate hope in material things, in our jobs, in our relationships, rather than in you. Forgive us for not receiving the gift of your hope. And forgive, forgive us, too, for not choosing the gift of your hope. Straighten the pathways of our hearts, removing the barriers, the detours that take us off the path. Help us to love you with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. Help us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to go where you lead us. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In, Psalm we, in the Psalms we read, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. O Israel, O church, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. So hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. There is forgiveness in Jesus. By his grace, Jesus offers you the free gift of his grace, of his love, of his peace that is beyond all understanding. And this is at the core, the heart of our hope. This is a season marked by gift giving and gift receiving. So receive God's gift, but don't keep it to yourself. Take this opportunity to share it. You can open up your microphones, um, greet one another as you pass the peace of Christ. Peace of Christ, everyone. Peace of Christ. 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 Peace of Mm -hmm. from, a, from a child, right? Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see the light. Silent star. 
God's people said. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from four passages in the scriptures. And one is a psalm, one is uh, from the book of Isaiah, and then one is from the Gospel of Mark, and one from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Now, they're short excerpts, so although that sounds like a long uh, section, uh, um, they, they go by relatively quickly. Um, one of the things in the Psalms in particular, and as we've talked about this on many occasions, is the Psalms not only speak uh, to us, they are God's word to us, but they often also speak on our behalf. Um, they phrase things in such a way and from the perspective of us responding to God. And in the history of the church, very often the Psalms are positioned in our scripture readings uh, to serve as that kind of response to the rest of scripture as we uh, read it and as we share it together. So this morning, I'm going to read through the Psalm first, and it has, in fact, three places in the passage that are, they're kind of like choruses or refrains. Um, they're the same phrase. It says, restore us, O God, make your face shine on us that we may be saved. And then as we read through the other passages, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring us back to that refrain, um, just to serve as a reminder in between each of our uh, instructions from scripture that this is part of the response that you and I are taking together. Psalm 80, hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God, Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbors, and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. And turning to the book of Isaiah. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, he says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. And our reading from Mark's gospel in chapter 13. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. 
at that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's, it's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that you would show us your ways and that you would teach us your paths, that you would guide us in your truth and teach us for you, our God, our Savior, and our hope is in you all day long. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, Happy New Year. Too soon? This Sunday marks the beginning of the church year, an invitation to embrace a yearly rhythm where the story of Jesus is the centerpiece of our worship life, the centerpiece of our faith life. And we begin with Advent. Our scriptures this morning come together around the central theme of Advent, which means arrival or coming. From Advent, we get adventure, which is the arrival of something about to happen. We say something is adventurous because we have an expectation of something about to happen. And this is the adventure of Advent, the expectation of something about to happen that is an arrival or a coming. Advent in the church anticipates God who arrives, God who comes to us in Jesus Christ. Throughout the history of the church, we have pondered how it is that God, in fact, comes to us. In the Middle Ages, a Benedictine monk, who was a deep thinker and also a songwriter, whose name was Bernard of Clairvaux, he wrote about how Christ comes to us in three ways. Christ has come to us in the flesh, and we celebrate his birth at Christmas. Christ comes to us in our hearts, and we receive the Holy Spirit who indwells us. And Christ will come to us again in his triumphant return that we anticipate. The coming of Christ is past and present and future, and Advent draws our attention to all three. Now, the season of Advent isn't in fact, something we find in the scriptures, but the pattern of commemorating special times of the year, festivals, that are connected to the story of God is indeed a biblical rhythm. And not only are these times connected to God's story, our participation in them connects us to God's story and connects us to God and one another and in a time like this, where we are socially distanced and isolated, we need these reminders of how we are, in fact, connected. We are not alone. God tells his people 
to structure their time around the saving acts of God in history, observing special seasons that acknowledge God's covenant relationship with his people and remembering defining moments of God's faithful and redemptive action. The rhythm of the church year, or liturgical calendar, invites us to locate ourselves within, inside God's story, rather than asking God to be located in our story. It is the reminder that we are part of a bigger story. And in the Bible, God calls his people to reorient, resituate their lives inside, within God's story, marking special seasons that remember God and his actions. And in so doing, our identity is shaped as the people who love God and love what God loves. And just like any good celebration, it takes time to prepare. And the Bible gives instructions for making preparations for these special occasions that indeed resituate us inside the story of God. And over time, the church developed these preparatory seasons. And so we have Lent that prepares us to celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus at Easter and Advent that prepares us to celebrate and welcome Christ who comes to us at Christmas and as we anticipate his return. And so we prepare. We prepare to welcome Christ. We prepare the way for the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Advent highlights the revelation of God who comes to us in Jesus Christ. And Advent highlights the response of God's people who expectantly wait, who straighten the pathways of our hearts, and who welcome Christ who comes. And if we're honest, we find ourselves in a unique moment in history where we need Jesus to come. To come and meet us in the fear and the anxiety that we're feeling each and every day that is amplified by the pandemic that separates us when what we need most is our friends and our family, our community, and our church. We need Jesus to come and carry us in the grief and pain of a season where we've had to say goodbye too soon and from far too far away. And so we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. And maybe it is entirely timely and providential that the first week of Advent draws our attention then to hope, the hope that we encounter in Jesus, who indeed comes to us. And the, we- and the reason we read our scriptures in the way we did this morning, highlighting that refrain from Psalm 80, was because I, th- I think that verse says something about the hope we experience in God and in the coming of Christ. Restore us, O God, and make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. The substance of hope is bound up in this verse, in this refrain. It is a work of restoration, restore us, that only God can accomplish, O God, through which we are blessed. God's face shines upon us, and by which we are saved that we may be saved. Christian hope is not the same as optimistic thinking or having a positive attitude, nor is it wish fulfillment. Christian hope is not based on our circumstances. Rather, it is based on a person, the person of Jesus, in whom we know restoration, blessing, and salvation. This is our prayer. Restore us, O God. Restore our physical health. Restore our emotional well-being. Heal the divisions in our world, in our country, in our city, in our neighborhoods, in our families. Revive us and restore us, we pray. And make your face shine on us. Bless us. May we know your presence in our midst. May we be a generation who seek your face. And save us. Save us from our sin and save us for your glory. In our second reading today, we read from Isaiah. Now, the first two-thirds of the book of Isaiah are dominated by themes of judgment. 
particularly judgment over Israel's rebellion to God's covenant promises. But then we see a shift, and in the latter third of the book, there's a focus around the message of hope. The hope that a future king from the line of David would fulfill God's covenant promises and bring healing and blessing and salvation. Isaiah prophesies that God will indeed come to redeem his people. And as we read in Isaiah 64, we read about the coming of God. Twice the prophet calls out to God to come down. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, tear the heavens, and come down. Come down to make your name known. Isaiah makes this request because he knows that God has come down before. In fact, he writes that God came and did awesome things that we did not expect. As he says in verse 3, his petition for God to come down is based on God's previous track record. That God was faithful in the past tells us that he is faithful in the present and will be faithful in the future. This is the pattern of remembrance in the Bible. We proclaim a past action of God, and in so doing, we experience it in the present and anticipate it in the future. We thank God for the forgiveness of our sins that was accomplished on the cross, what Jesus has done in the past, and we experience now in the present forgiveness when we come in repentance and confess our sin. And we anticipate God's forgiveness and our healing in the future, ultimately in our eternal restoration. And as we heard in the video from the Bible Project, it is God's past faithfulness that motivates hope for the future. We look forward by looking backward. From God's history with his people, Isaiah affirms that God acts on behalf of those who wait for him, as he says in verse 4. And one commentator puts it this way, Biblically speaking, to wait is to manifest the kind of trust that is willing to commit itself to God over the long haul. It is to continue to believe and expect when all others have given up. It is to believe that it is better for something to happen in God's time than for it to happen on my initiative in my time. It is to believe that it is better for something to happen in God's time than for it to happen on my initiative in my time. Waiting for God is connected to our understanding of biblical hope. Hope is both a gift and a choice, a gift that God gives because of what he has accomplished and a choice for us to receive and respond in obedience. And what does that choice look like? to wait, to receive God's hope, and to act in that way. Well, in verse 5, Isaiah explains how we are to respond as a people who wait for God and respond, therefore, as a people of hope. He says that God comes to the help of those who gladly do right and who remember God's ways. In other words, waiting for God and experiencing hope doesn't appear to be something that is passive. Waiting for God includes gladly doing right and remembering God's ways. So with joy, we pursue righteousness. As we live in alignment with God's purpose, his ways for our lives. That's really different than what we usually think of as waiting. Like when we're waiting in line for groceries or, or we're waiting in a doctor's office or even waiting for the NHL to figure out when the hockey season is finally going to start. Isaiah says that God comes to the help of those who gladly do right and who remember God's ways. And, may, and maybe that sounds a little familiar because maybe it sounds a little bit like God helps those who help themselves. But I assure you, it's not the same. Joyfully doing righteousness is very rarely, if ever, about helping ourselves. More often than not, doing righteousness is about helping others, particularly those who are vulnerable. Embracing hope is connected to waiting upon God, and waiting upon God 
is connected to embracing hope. To the one who waits upon God, God comes. There is a sense here that, in fact, our doing precedes his coming. Now, not in the sense that our doing causes his coming, but in the sense that our doing, our stepping out in faith and obedience, precedes our knowledge or affirmation of his coming to meet us. We hear this echoed in Jesus' words in John's gospel. In John chapter 7, Jesus says, Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Here, doing the will of God leads to a deeper understanding of Jesus. And as one commentator remarks, if we wonder where God is in our lives, the key is to begin doing what we know, allowing him, allowing God to manifest himself when and where he chooses. According to Isaiah, the lesson of sacred history is that he will meet those who wait for him in this way. Gladly doing right and remembering God's ways. In other words, waiting on God doesn't mean we sit on our hands and remain idle. It doesn't mean we get impatient and stressed out about the lines that we're in. Neither does it imply that Christian hope is something that you and I can create or manufacture or achieve ourselves. It is a gift and it is a choice. The journey of discovering God's purpose in our lives includes our active pursuit of his will, which he will confirm. And so we encounter hope when we wait upon God, who comes to the help of those who gladly do right and remember his ways. Our other two scripture readings also comment on this posture of waiting and embracing hope. In Mark's gospel, the passage that we read tells us of the day when Christ will return, a day that we can't predict, a day that is unexpected, as Isaiah reminds us. And so we wait in hope. And we're told that waiting includes being on guard and staying alert. Therefore, keep watch. In some translations, it says, stay alert and pray. Again, we have an active, engaged waiting process. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And Paul's letter to the church in Corinth affirms the active waiting process. Not only does he say that we are to eagerly wait for the return of Christ, but he reminds us that we don't lack any spiritual gift and that we have been enriched in every way, presumably to joyfully pursue right or righteousness and remember God's ways. And so we return to the psalmist's refrain, Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Christian hope is bound up in this rhythm. God and God alone restores us. Jesus has given his life, a ransom for all, to rescue us from the present evil age, to reconcile us to the Father, bestowing upon us the ministry of reconciliation. And God shines his face upon us, in the Bible, God's shining face is associated with his blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And examples of shining faces in scripture are those who have been in the presence of God, transfigured. Their faces literally glow from having been in God's company. In his presence, we are changed. And hope looks forward by looking backward to the resurrection, where our salvation was accomplished. Our hope is certain because Christ's work is complete. It is finished. This is why Christian hope isn't related to our personal circumstances, whether we are in a difficult place or not, whether we are in a lockdown in a global pandemic or sunning ourselves on a beach in the South Pacific. Christian hope is related to a person, Jesus Christ, who is the only one who can restore us, who gives us the blessing of his presence, the indwelling of his spirit, and who shines his face upon us, and who, by his completed work on the cross, has secured our salvation. And so 
we wait in hope for Christ who has come, who is come, and who will come. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you, you came to us. You joyfully pursued the righteousness of God, preferring the will of the Father, and showing us what obedience looks like. And you come to us. You meet us in our brokenness. You are present with us, among us, in us. You shine your face upon us so that we are indeed blessed, so that we are transfigured and transformed, so that we can follow in your obedience and serve your world who are in need of knowing your hope and knowing you. And you will come again to renew all things. And so we look forward with hope because of the certainty and security that you give us. Teach us to receive your gift of hope and choose and to choose hope as we actively and eagerly wait your return in your holy name we pray amen
Now receive the gift of God's blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.